Hello, everybody, and welcome to CEO Unplugged. I am Nate Marino, straight Nate from Elvis Grand in the Morning Show, and it wouldn't be CEO Unplugged unless we had a CEO. And here we have Matt Bachman, uh, the CEO of Wandering Bear Coffee. And Matt, uh, I have a lot of questions for you. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm here to do my best. Thanks for having me today, Nate. Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, um, why coffee? <laughs> <laughs> what you know? What what is your background? Just to start, like, what's your education, and uh, where did you come from that you decided I want to be an entrepreneur? I want to be a CEO one day. Where did this start? Where, you know, this is yeah, I mean, the background in coffee, the two are somewhat related, I guess. I mean, you know, both uh, yeah started drinking a lot of coffee during college myself, as I'm sure many can relate. Um, okay. uh, University of Michigan undergrad was was a uh, a high burn consultant after college right so lots of lots of long hours and then went to grad school here in new york um where i met my co-founder ben gordon uh back in 2013 and we started wandering bear in 2014 both of us were uh were strong coffee addicts coffee aficionados the type of you know both both of us by um just habit were the type that would walk multiple blocks out of their way for the better cup of coffee, right? So, yeah. so you know, p folks can certainly relate to that, right? You have something on the corner and then you have something, you know, of that's, you know, just a little bit farther, one more subway stop and it, that, that's totally worth it. So that's where we were at in 2013. Uh, both of us had been making, this was before we met, had been making cold brew at home, uh, then year round myself during the summers. Uh, and then so September 2013, we walk into a grad school classroom uh, see each other with cold brew coffee. I, I brought mine from home. He had brought his from home, uh, and, and strike up a conversation about just that, uh, less than six months later, we're in a kitchen in, in Queens brewing batches, trying to figure out just what the heck we're doing. Um, and if we can make a business out of it. So, so coffee, the coffee piece, why coffee that came from a love for the product. If we're being honest, probably an addiction to the product or at least the caffeine in it. Um, and, and that's that was the base that you know friendly competition to make the the strongest coffee became the base for what is today wandering bear wow so your explanation makes it seem so easy right but that's actually the problem right yeah. uh for you know in food and beverage or, or even like certain parts of of of, con of consumer products it is relative i mean you know anyone can do it i i spend a lot of my day uh at least at, at the early i spend a lot of my day uh, you know, in the customer service channels or, or on Facebook, just talking people through making their own cold brew at home, how to use our coarse ground product to like make their own and do what Ben and I were doing back in, back in the early days. So, mm -hmm. so that part's easy. It gets harder for, at least for a good period of time as you go along and get bigger. Really? Now, now you made it seem so simple. Like I just said, um, what was the hardest part in, in, in getting this started and off the ground? What was the one thing you look back on perhaps and say, oh my God, that almost ended Wandering Bear Coffee before it even started or as soon as we started? What was that one hurdle that you're so glad that you, you got over? Yeah, it, it, those evolve, right? And so like even this year, like every year there is one, but if, but to, to, you know, I, the way you phrased it, right? The thing that could have killed us, yeah. right? it was absolutely getting manufacturing off the ground. Really? Right? Oh my God, absolutely. So, you know, for, for us, and, and, and that almost killed us multiple times. I mean, like, listen, we, we, we sell coffee, we make a product that people like, if we can't make the product, we don't have a business, right? And so, you know, the thing that, that absolutely uh, has enabled us to get to this point and to a point where we can scale, where we can double the business every single year uh, is, is figuring out that manufacturing piece. And you have to say, hey, this started with, uh, with me and Ben in a shift kitchen out in Queens doing literally every part of the process from grinding the coffee all the way through cleaning the equipment after we brewed. Uh, learning that like our time was actually better spent hiring someone, like focusing on the brewing in those days and hiring someone to help us and clean alongside us. So we didn't essentially have two shifts, a brewing shift and a cleaning shift was like a major revelation back in 2014. Um, so, so yeah, figuring that out and, and you know, there, there was, uh, there were a couple times in the early days where, where everything just completely fell apart on us. Like one day we had a place to produce product, the next day we didn't. Um, and so we were, uh, we were, you know, a bit, has nothing to do with the name, but we were like very much wandering in the early days, uh, you know, from facility to facility just to get 
just to make enough product to keep up with the sales we were, we were making. So it was, were you like growing beans on your rooftop terrace? Or? <laughs> so, so co coffee 101, right? Very narrow band of, uh, of the globe where coffee grows. None of, none of those, uh, none of those zips are anywhere near New York city. Um, <laughs> we've, o we, we've, we've always sourced our coffee, um, through local roasters uh, or through roasting uh, partners now across the country. Um, and, and our coffee has always come from Central and South America. So at the time, I think we were using, uh, we were using a Colombian, uh, Colombian dark roast. Now we use uh, primarily uh, an organic coffee. We've been able to source well from Peru for a while now. In Peru. Okay. I picked coffee beans in Costa Rica. Nice. It's such, I mean, I'm sure you've been down <laughs> for work for work or as a tourist. No, as a tourist, right? So it was uh, kind of a funny story. My friend is big into coffee like you. In fact, he went and bought one of the um, Costa Rican coffee makers, which is just, you know, a filter and a you know, very interesting way to make coffee. But we go to a coffee plantation and we show up and they show us the fields. And then at some point during the explanation, the guy hands us a basket, which we strap around our waist. He says, all right, here's how you pick the beans. Go out there and pick us some beans. And I do it for about 15, 20 minutes. And I got, you know, quarter of the basket full. I'm like, I'm get a little tired. So I take it back to the guy and he looks in it and he goes, you can do a little more in there. <laughs> like, it, I mean, it, wait, it, it, it's incredibly hard work, requires a lot of dexterity, but then also to do it fat, the, the, you know, in, in most, on most coffee plantations, you have a mix of ripe and ready coffee cherries and coffee cherries that are still needing to mature on the vine. And so to be able to move fast, to hit your quotas and actually be able to identify and pick the right ones from, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly hard and very manual work, yeah. um, you know, at high altitudes a lot of the time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and it's intense. For the person that just goes to Starbucks or wherever they happen to get their coffee every day, they take for granted the fact that that coffee came from somewhere that somebody picked. And it just it just boggled my mind to be picking these beans that somebody would eventually go to put into a cup of coffee. Long, long supply chain. A lot of, yeah. lot of touches along the way, for sure. I mean, it wasn't just Juan Valdez, you know, with that bourbon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot more than that. So back to the name, Wandering Bear. Where did that come from? It's always been more of the brand's personality than a literal bear, right? So Wandering Bear encapsulates our, uh, what we think is, is our unique brand of strength, right? Mm -hmm. we, are, we, are big, we are big, strong coffee, like a big, strong bear, but we have a smooth side. There's a, there's a, gen, there is a gentility and a curiosity to our strength, uh, smoothness to our strength. Um, and so, so, yeah, that's, it's really our spirit. Spirit of the bear. Of the brand. Of the brand. So what's the mission statement then for your company? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. We do not have like a clear mission statement um, as a cut, not, not something I can like rattle off. Our, our, our focus has always been on the product, right? So like product and product quality and product consistency has always been what's driven the brand. We don't have a very wide ranging product portfolio. We make very strong, very smooth coffee. Uh, and we specialize, and I think one of the things we've done best is putting it into uh, into packaging formats and creating uh, and creating delivery systems around it, like subscriptions, easy ordering, et cetera, online, uh, wide availability online that make getting our our products um, very seamless for the consumer. So why so strong? Why did you choose for your coffee to be so strong and that for and for that to be one of the I guess, uh, you know, things holding up your brand. Yeah, of, co of course. So, so when there are only two ingredients in a product, right, coffee and water, the key flavor lever that you have to pull with it is the coffee itself and the amount of it that you use. So Ben and I have always felt that stronger coffee tastes better. Now that's not like uniformly true. If you make like really strong coffee with really bad coffee or coffee that has been roasted properly or brewed correctly or stored correct, right? Like your know, strong coffee can taste horrible. But our strong coffee tastes really good because we use a lot of really good organic coffee to make it. We brew it correctly and we package it to stay fresh. So uh, it all comes down to, to the product, the added benefit, you know, the product being you know, the, the taste, the body of it, the, the, the richness, the fullness in the cup, how dark it is, right? Um, but uh, the added benefit uh, with, with our coffee, because right now all we make, we don't make a decaf, right? All of our coffee is, is, is full calf. You use yeah. more coffee, you get more caffeine. So depending on what you're comparing it to, 
that our coffee is as much as is twice as strong as as, uh, as others on the market. That's that's something that on a caffeine uh, basis, yeah, yeah, that's something you should be proud of. I know. Uh, instead of having seven cups of coffee, I know my dad when he was driving a semi would probably just have one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have gotten that. That is you know, again, like in the, in the comments a lot. Like you know, many um, many. You know, we have a, a recommended six ounce over ice serving, right? Which is essentially the same thing as a Starbucks tall, right? Exactly. When you when you when you uh, when you when you include the ice, um, many balk at that before they try it. And they're like, you know what? Actually, I'll take four. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's strong stuff. Okay, so the process of getting to where you have become CEO, you had the idea and then all of the work that went into it. What has been the, the biggest thing that you've learned? I mean, obviously you were a grad student. Where did you go? Um, uh, Columbia, New York. Columbia. Okay. So you go from being a grad student to starting this company uh, with ideas occurring throughout the entire process. What are some things that you didn't learn in school that you've, you wish you could tell people that are starting their own companies right now? Something that perhaps wasn't covered in a textbook or a lecture and you wish that, why didn't they explain this? What would, it, would that be to you? Yeah, and I think you, br you bring up two interesting points, the, the journey to becoming CEO through founding a business, right? Yeah. And then, then, yeah, I think that actually intersects the, the out of classroom or off textbook question because you, the the most critical part of building uh, anything and scaling anything is the people you have around you doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you know everything related to uh, team motivation, recruiting, ta you know understanding what talent you need, when and why uh, to surround yourself with. I'm not sure that conforms well to a textbook or to a classroom. Yet it's without a doubt the most important thing, right? Whether it's the uh, this, you know, the partners we have recruited, um, you know, as, as vendors or as agencies or the advisors and board members we've surrounded ourselves with. And obviously the team members that have worked with us both today or over the years, like that is why this has been possible. And I think the journey to becoming CEO, you know, the, you know, be, you know at the beginning, you're a founder and you're an entrepreneur, like at the absolute core, you are doing anything and everything you can just to uh, just to make it to the next day, the next week, that whatever that next milestone is. For us, it was literally the next batch. It's like we signed up, you know, we, we started as an office subscription business that uh, until COVID hit, office was a huge part of our business, over half of our business, uh, coffee, uh, cold brew on tap, et cetera, at offices. And, and so you know, in that first summer, maybe we signed up 50 subscription uh, offices around New York City, uh, the next milestone, we were just clawing to get to that next batch of coffee to fill the orders we had on deck for next week. You become a CEO when you start having to manage, motivate, and, and set direction for your team or for a team. Um, and, and so you know, that is absolutely the most important part and the part that is, uh, I think, hardest, hardest, uh, hardest to know you're getting right, hardest to teach I think outside of just like practically having to uh to do it in our our general philosophy has always been just do everything with the best intentions right that's often the best you can do and so like we have a very empathetic approach to our you know management management our team in the perspective and just you know it, it is a it is a one team uh philosophy but we also you know very certain that uh you know we we remember that it's like a collection of individuals that all have their own needs, their own interests, their own career path development journeys that they want to go on and, and making sure that um, we create an opportunity where everyone can, where it can be mutually beneficial, right? Where what, what we need as a company and what they need as a person can, can intersect for a period of time and, and, and let that period of time be when we're working together. You brought it up COVID. How did that change the game plan for wandering bear? Uh, it I mean, it was like, you know, we we're going left and now we're going right. Um, I mean, it was, it was a very big change for our business. Um, heading into 2020, we had actually made the strategic decision to double down resources. And when I think of it, you know, double down resources, hire more team behind, put more capital behind, invest more marketing dollars behind our office coffee business, right? It was growing 100% year over year doubling. 
Uh, you know, we had some great uh, national, very large office accounts in the pipeline, some of which started buying, you know, started distributing, buying from us in February of last year. Um, you know, March 15th, that all stopped. What was, yeah. you know, 65% of our business and, and almost all of the profit went to zero. Wow. Um, still, and it's still there today. Maybe we're, we're down about 95% that part of the business. So we had to, uh, I mean, this was uh, April, I think was spent trying to figure out, okay, like, will this be back by summer? Like, you know, do we, is this about just kind of grinding it out until then? Or do we need a big, bigger, uh, a bigger strategic change? And by May, we went to the board and just laid it down. It's like, listen, you know, we all hope offices are going to come back. We believe they'll come back. We'll be ready when they do come back, but uh, we need to plan as if they never will. And if that bit is, if that business that was, you know, the core of what we were doing is gone uh, and we committed to focusing uh, on the consumer, right on the direct to consumer business, uh, serving people at home and at their new home offices um, and doing that through through e-commerce channels. So today, um, today the business is about 75% e-commerce. And through the growth, through that strategic shift, through retooling everything we were doing, we were able to essentially stay flat during a very, very challenging year. Wow. Congratulations on that. I it mean, was, uh, I kind of said before, it was absolutely a team effort. Wow. That's looking at the way so many companies reacted to this and obviously some didn't react as effectively and they're no longer companies. Uh, that is, is something that I think you probably just have innately. Do you feel like that you have that sense that, okay, we have to shift and I'm sure you get some feedback from your, your, your co-founder and, and everybody around you, but what, what percentage of the decision-making process is you deciding that as a CEO? I would, you know, I wouldn't say that the decision making process is like, you know, the, you know, the George Bush quote, like I'm the decider, you know, it's the, yeah. uh, you know, that, that, that isn't so much my view is that like the CEO's job is to call it when the discussion is done and enable everyone to move forward. So I guess like, you know, it's not so much decision by edict. It's about taking in the relevant piece of information and making sure decision cycles don't stress to stretch too long. Right. And, you know, we, you know, it's also about being very clear with, uh, with the team uh, where others have the decision authority and where they're the one that needs to call it. Say, hey, you have till Friday to make your call on this. It's your call. And being very clear on that versus being clear about when it is when you are holding that decision, when it's you that will make the ultimate call and letting them hold that reverse accountability. And, you know, I'm, you know, create a very transparent environment and you know the goal is always to to make decisions right because being caught in uh in analysis right it, you know you could uh erode your ability to make the right decision just by letting too much time pass yeah. um and so to your question of like you know how to navigate it and how to do it i will say like i have always um felt uh, I, I guess we're just like somewhat calm or more comfortable in those moments of crisis. Like you know, we talked about earlier when the manufacturing was falling apart, like that, that obviously really sucked and was very yeah. stressful. Um, but there also is uh, a, a certain calm I find in the nothing to lose type of state where you're like, well, this is about as close to rock bottom as we're going to be. So let's just accept that and figure out what we're going to do, given everything that's it. like, you know, just radical acceptance of like the shit, the, the uh, apologies for, for cursing on podcasts. I'm not sure if, uh, you can say whatever decided. the fuck you want there. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, not, not, we'll sure where, not, <laughs> not sure where this was, uh, where this was streaming the, um, but, but yeah, I mean, just like being in the muck that is, uh, that is that's fun and i think one of the reasons it's fun and i think a lot of uh, a lot of other uh, business leaders would agree is because you have license uh to make decisions to make calls that you otherwise might not because there are fewer good options yeah and that can feel cathartic and can feel good especially when um you know, when there are things that you've wanted to do for a long time um you know, a great example of that is our office, right? We no longer have an office as Wandering Bear. A year before Ben and I had uh, had made the decision that we were gonna really upgrade our office, we were gonna move into a space that 
uh, down in the financial district that, that you know, had some amenities and, and was like a, a great congregating space for the team. And we wanted people to come to work and, and like, you know, enjoy that office atmosphere. Um, you know, as you know, like people also want flexibility. And so that didn't really pan out. We also had like a flexible work type of yeah. culture. And so we were maybe at 50% occupancy in this great, beautiful office. Like, could we have gotten rid of the office then with no cause? Like that would have, uh, yes, we could have, but like, you know, it would have caught some slack, flack for it from the team because like well, people liked that half a week or three days a week in the office. Yeah. And they also liked their two days at home. Now we're all remote. Um, that's going great. And, and this is how we intend to keep building, uh, building and scaling the team for a while via these, you know, via zoom calls and, and all the new skills we've learned. So like that's one micro example, but, um, but, but yeah, it was a good one. You brought up a great point analysis paralysis. And I know you probably studied that ad nauseum in school and you've encountered it through starting wandering bear and getting it up and running and, and continuing it. And it's such a fascinating thing to look at that you, waste so much time looking at all of the different options that as a CEO, I have to imagine you are the person that just says, all right, we're done talking about it. Decision time. Right. And so that is something that, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think you can teach in school and congratulations. Well, well but, but yeah, I guess my, my, my comment there though, is that, you know, is I think about, it's about being attuned to your own weaknesses and I am an analyst by training. Right. So like my instinct is naturally to dive into the numbers and to search for a method of finding an answer and then apply it to find an answer. Yeah. And an answer doesn't always exist. And so like for me, and this is like ongoing, but like you know, or for, for any for any leader, for any manager, it's about putting the structures in place, public deadlines, et cetera. Uh, shared accountability for making a decision. Yeah, you know, Ben and I'll do that. I'll be like, hey Ben can't let this don't don't let me stretch this past this date yeah. like for you know and putting those in place so that you don't find yourself in those analysis spirals yeah okay so looking forward obviously uh the pandemic hit you adjusted how far out is wandering bears game plan now uh are you looking forward to when people do return to the office or potentially it's a mix of both have you done those models uh, you know, to the analysis comment, we just ran like a really big national survey trying to answer that exact question of when and for how many days people expect to be going back to the office. I haven't seen the results yet, but like we're trying to answer that exact question. Um, the, uh, the, the plan for us is to continue building, uh, building the direct to consumer business, continue building e-commerce and really focus. We built this engine now that's been capable of delivering a scale and a predictability of brand awareness for Wandering Bear that we never could have imagined yeah. before, before all of this. That is absolutely the focus for scaling trial and awareness of brand. We do know that offices will return. This will end, like we can be, this will, you know, I, I, you know, I don't feel like I'm being that, that, uh, that controversial in, in that declaration. And so the question for us is obviously how many days per week, like what percentage of the prior normal will we be at? It will certainly be lower. You know, we know that the expectation around days in office has shifted as people have acquired a new skill uh, and new appetite for working remotely. The, um, so for us, I mean, it really is a focus on continuing to spread, spread the word, uh, make ourselves a stable product for strong coffee lovers at home and at the office uh, and making it very easy for them to, uh, to get in the mix. Um, the social media aspect of things. Um, are you, who's leaving the comments? <laughs> Is yeah. That, so I, I, I'm, I'm like the, the social threads and, and, and Facebook, Instagram ads. And yeah. all that. Um, a, a, a lot of the time, at least on the weekends, it's me on the weekends. Really? It's me. Yeah, yeah. On the weekends, it's me during, during the week. Uh, it's our, uh, our social media community manager who's responsible for, for building up our, our influencer and ambassador community and, and our, our marketing director largely in the comments, but like, you know, customer service is the number one focus of our business. It's actually, you know, we're, we are, we're a small team. Um, and we don't actually have a dedicated customer service person. Customer service is a shared function, uh, that rotates with you know a couple triagers that make sure the tickets get spread out yeah. uh, and, and everyone's involved in the mix. Um, 
and that direct line in the in the comments threads and um, and, and with like direct to the consumer in, in that really like unfiltered and raw environment is both super entertaining. Like I just absolutely yeah, love it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we can, we can have some fun with it, but it's also like a really good source of, of feedback and frankly, like really some, you know, especially negative feedback to be honest, like if, if there is, if, and when there is negative feedback, it's super unfiltered <laughs> because no one's expecting like, you know, the CEO of the company to be there, like, you know, reading it and internalizing it and getting, yeah. So, um, and responding to it. Uh, yeah. and, and so like, that's the best. I mean, someone sends you a customer service email. Most of the time these days, I think there's a somewhat softer edge. You know, you're sending it to a person when you're on social media, you're just kind of putting it out in the ether. Yeah. Um, trying to not get your account banned, but the, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's us. I mean, it's someone from the team and, and Friday through Sunday, it's definitely me. So you're never off. You're never out. You never take time off. I mean, you're constantly monitoring uh, your business. You're constantly thinking about Monday start. You're constantly doing something. Is that one of the keys to your success right now? I think that is a common trait um, among entrepreneurs and, and a lot of business leaders. Um, yeah, it, it's. I, I think the difference is how much you lean into it. And, and I fully embrace it. So like, I think, you know, the way my mind works, it's never, it's never off. And that's like a blessing and a curse. But so, so like I can either choose to, uh, to let my mind be focused on, on the business and to plug in for a couple hours, like on the weekends to make sure I'm like getting, you know, getting all that out and, 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 you know, then move on. Or I could be totally somewhere else where I hang out with my wife and kids and totally distracted and like wanting to be in my phone and half responding to email. I mean, it's to me, it's much better. Um, I, I always, I remember thinking as a kid, I would have preferred year round school, very unpopular yeah. opinion. But like, I always just remember thinking like, I would much rather have like, you know, a couple small vacations throughout the year and then like not lose the momentum of all the, the stuff we were doing. So um, yeah, I think I applied that to, to work life as well. Well, what's next? What's down the road? I mean, what developments do you guys have in the pipeline? What do you personally, I mean, what, I guess, bigger question here, what's the goal for you in life? Like, yeah, uh, as CEO I mean, currently of Wandering Bear Coffee, I mean, you're building this great, incredible brand with a unique product. Where are you going? And where are you taking Wandering Bear with you? Yeah, I mean, right now, the focus is getting Wandering Bear to a place of sustainable scale, mm -hmm. which is both size, you know, size relevance, uh, profitability, all the things that it need, you know, needs to ensure that the brand can live on. I don't, I don't intend to run Wandering Bear forever. And I think the sign of my success will be uh, putting it in a position where it can be continue to grow and be led by, by someone else. Right. And so that, that is, that is my job right now is to get Wandering Bear to that point. That's where, that's where I'm focused. And what comes after that, I have absolutely no idea. Um, totally not thinking about it. Um, you know, it can, I can plan out my, you know, my personal life, you know, wife, kids, house, whatever that, that's, a, that's all, that, that, that's all vision boarded somewhere. But the, um, but yeah, business right, right now, very focused on getting Wandering Bear to that like critical, uh, critical milestone. And, and for us, you know, for the, the, the products and, you know, we view our license to make it is a brand uh, to make anything that really enhances the at home or, or at work. Uh, coffee experience, the strong coffee experience. Um, right now, we're very focused on the core set that you'll see on the site. You know, a lot of what we, the coffee on tap line has been incredibly uh, popular and successful this year. Um, and so continued innovation and, and line expansion, flavor expansion there um, is definitely in the works uh, for this year. Um, and then, you know, more on the technical side as well, right? Our, our, our big focus for us is making the experience of being a wandering bear customer, whether, uh, that is a, a, uh, occasional purchaser or like our most loyal subscriber, more seamless, more magical, more fun, uh, more engaging. Uh, and, and so we have, um, so some, technical products as well you know the, to make or reordering easier that we're that we're testing or to make uh to make loyalty um and and uh and sharing wandering bear products more fun uh, in the works as well so so that's all coming later this year is that a wandering bear hat oh yeah that is fantastic well, the uh your brand <laughs> the uh 
the well, you got a play you can add you can add them for for uh for a small for a small price to any order on the site but i'm happy to uh to send you one and send you some coffee oh, after no, this I'm up, to, uh, up to up to up to <laughs> up to up to white plains I am. Oh God! <laughs> if it makes yeah. it that far, God, it's like yeah. the abyss of New York. Your your order would ship from Brooklyn, so I think we can do it. Um, I'll go and pick it up. Please show me the factory. I want to see where you started to where you are now, and the um, everything in between. The uh, be a fun uh, be a fun tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. So let's wrap things up here. CEO unplug Matt Bachman of Wandering Bear Coffee. Um, what words do you live by? What words have you kind of stuck with? Maybe you. Sp- a phrase that that has stuck with you since high school maybe something that you picked up in college and has kept you going and uh brought you to where you are today so i i was raised um with a certain confidence in the power of positive thinking mm-hmm. uh my grandma who is a really uh well-known uh childhood educator in the chicago suburbs now grant i say that in family lore, she was a famous, world-renowned teacher. Uh, I, I have not actually gone to verify it in, in local newspapers, but, um, but she, she was a great, a great teacher. Taught, taught myself, uh, taught me and my sister uh, how to read and all, all that stuff. But anyway, she, had, she had a saying, um, you know, when, when times were getting tougher, when you were being negative, to act yourself into a new way of thinking. Um, and so that is, you know, a, a family maxim that is now like extended to my wife's family and gets repeated a lot, but just the, the power of forcing your physical behaviors and enforcing your mental state to match where you want it to be versus where it is in a specific moment, I have always found to be very useful, uh, powerful and, uh, and timeless. That's phenomenal. Uh, and I think you got to put that on a t-shirt <laughs> uh, with a bear on it, of course. Um, well, honestly, Matt, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I've, I'm glad we recorded this because I'm going to go back and write down some notes. <laughs> so when I start my own brand, uh, I have a cheat sheet from somebody that has done it successfully so far. And uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, Matt. Likewise, Nate. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Matt Bachman here on CEO Unplugged, the CEO of Wandering Bear Coffee. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye.